Hey folks, I know I am just an old guy telling stories, but please leave a like and subscribe before we start. Let's enjoy in today's stories. All right, so before you jump to any conclusions, let me just say, I know it was a stupid idea, like monumentally stupid. I'd been reading about the dark web for years, just out of curiosity, nothing more. All those Reddit threads about weird stuff people bought, stories about creepy items showing up at people's doors. It was something I never thought I'd get myself into. But here I am, a victim of my own boredom and, well, fascination with the bizarre. It all started about two months ago. I was bored one night, scrolling through the internet like usual. You know the drill. Random YouTube videos, Reddit threads, a little bit of doom scrolling. At some point, I stumbled across a thread discussing unusual items purchased off the dark web. Some were harmless, old comic books, vintage electronics, that kind of thing. But then someone mentioned printers. Why printers? No idea. But the idea got stuck in my head, and it wouldn't leave. I figured, what's the worst that could happen, right? People were saying they found these old printers, supposedly haunted or glitchy, but it sounded like a lot of urban legend stuff. My curiosity got the better of me, and I spent the next few days researching. You know when something so dumb takes over your brain, and you just have to know more? Yeah, that was me. The printer was becoming an obsession. I won't go into detail about how I found it, but let's just say I navigated through a few sketchy forums, a bit of Tor browsing, and then there it was, an auction. Some beat up old printer. The listing had almost no details, just a grainy photo and a brief description that basically said, vintage printer works on its own. I know, I know, huge red flag, right? But that's what piqued my interest. Works on its own? It sounded ridiculous. A part of me thought it was a scam, but the other part thought, what if? So like the idiot I am, I bought it. The price wasn't outrageous either, just 50 bucks. That's cheaper than the printer I have at my desk right now. I didn't think much would come of it. Maybe I'd get a broken hunk of junk, or it just wouldn't arrive at all. But then a week later, a package showed up on my doorstep. Brown, taped up box. No labels, no return address. The printer was heavier than I expected, and it looked ancient. Like something you'd see in an office from the 90s. It had one of those paper trays that only holds a few sheets, and the ink cartridge area was... strange. It didn't look like any standard model, but then again, it wasn't anything I'd ever seen in stores. I set it up in the spare room where I do my work, more out of curiosity than anything else. The thing was old, but not in a cool vintage way. It had this weird smell, like burnt plastic mixed with... mildew? The power cord was frayed, and it was missing a few buttons. At this point I figured I'd been duped. Fifty bucks for a piece of junk. Still, I thought, what the hell? I plugged it in, expecting nothing. Maybe it would make a noise, then fizzle out. That's what I wanted to happen. But no, the thing whirred to life, like really started up. The sound it made was unnerving, almost mechanical, but way too loud for its size, and it vibrated the whole desk. I didn't even try to print anything. I was too weirded out by the fact that it worked. It had no software, no drivers, and it didn't even have a screen to display anything. But there it was, powered on, sitting on my desk like it had a mind of its own. I figured I'd just leave it alone for now, maybe take a look at it later when I had more time. A few days passed and nothing happened. The printer just sat there silent. No weird noises, no creepy prints. I kind of forgot about it, to be honest. But then, one night, things started to get off. It was around 2 a.m. when I heard a noise coming from the spare room. At first, I thought it was the wind, or maybe the heater kicking on. But when I walked in, the printer was powered on, even though I know I had unplugged it earlier that day. The lights were blinking and I could hear it whirring. Then, to my absolute confusion, it started printing. I froze in place. I hadn't sent anything to the printer. 
There wasn't even paper in the tray. But there it was, spitting out pages like it was on some kind of automatic printing spree. I grabbed a few sheets and that's when I realized something was seriously wrong. The first page had a black and white image of a doll on it, like one of those old-fashioned porcelain dolls with dead staring eyes and a cracked face. The kind of doll you'd expect to find in a horror movie attic. The second page was another doll. Different, but just as creepy. And then another. And another. Page after page of these unsettling grainy doll photos. My hands were shaking as I flipped through them. But then, the fifth page came out. And I nearly dropped the whole stack. It was a photo of my grandma. The same old black and white photo that hung in our hallway when I was a kid. She had died over 20 years ago and the picture was burned into my memory because it was the one my mom kept after she passed. There was no way the printer could have known that. I hadn't scanned anything, hadn't uploaded any photos, and the printer wasn't connected to anything. No cables, no Wi-Fi. It wasn't even plugged into the wall. I stood there staring at the photo of my grandma, my mind racing to figure out how it was even possible. Then, without warning, the printer jammed. A loud crunching noise echoed through the room and the lights flickered off. That was it. I yanked the thing off the desk, opened the window and hurled it out as hard as I could. It landed with a dull thud in the backyard and I slammed the window shut. The rest of that night I couldn't sleep. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was seriously wrong. Something that had to do with that printer and those photos. Part of me wanted to go downstairs and make sure it was still outside but another part of me was too scared to check. I figured that throwing it out the window would be the end of it, but of course things never go that smoothly, do they? I woke up the next morning, groggy and unsettled. I'd barely slept after what happened and my brain was foggy with this weird mix of dread and embarrassment. Embarrassment because I kept telling myself I had overreacted. It was just a malfunctioning piece of old tech, right? Maybe the printer had some leftover memory from a previous owner, and somehow it had printed those weird photos. There had to be an explanation. Something logical that I could latch onto and shake off the uneasiness. But still, that picture of my grandma. That's the part I couldn't explain away. I had no digital copies of that photo anywhere. The original was a framed print tucked away in a dusty box in my parents' attic. So how did it show up on a printer that wasn't even plugged in? I decided to go downstairs and see what kind of damage I'd done by tossing the printer out the window. I didn't want my neighbors asking questions or, worse, seeing it and thinking I was some kind of lunatic throwing electronics out of my house at 3 a.m. When I opened the back door, the printer was still there sitting in the middle of the yard like a forgotten relic. It didn't look broken, at least not from a distance. I approached it slowly, half expecting it to start whirring again or spit out more of those creepy photos. But it just sat there, lifeless. I bent down to pick it up, and that's when I noticed something strange. The paper tray was completely empty, no sign of the dozens of pages it had printed last night. I distinctly remembered the stack of doll photos I'd been holding. I had thrown the printer, but the paper should have been scattered all over the grass. Yet there was nothing, no crumpled pages, no torn scraps, nothing. I felt a knot form in my stomach. Maybe I'd imagined the whole thing. Maybe I'd been half asleep and it was some bizarre dream. But as I lifted the printer, I saw something that made my heart skip a beat. A single sheet of paper, face down, half stuck under the device. My hands were shaking as I picked it up and turned it over. It was another photo. This time it wasn't a doll. It wasn't my grandma either. It was me. A picture of me, sitting at my desk in the spare room. Same clothes, same lighting, everything but the angle. It was taken from the doorway, like someone had been standing there watching me from behind as I worked. I don't know how long I stood there staring at that photo. My mind was racing, but nothing was making sense. The photo was blurry, like it had been taken with an old cheap camera, but the details were unmistakable. 
It was me, and it was recent, maybe taken within the last few days. I dropped the paper like it had burned me, suddenly overwhelmed with the feeling that I wasn't alone. My first instinct was to check my house. Maybe someone had broken in. Maybe someone had been messing with me, sneaking in to take photos while I was working. The idea of it made my skin crawl, but at least it was something I could rationalize. Creepy as hell, but explainable. I rushed inside and checked every room, every closet, even under the bed. I'm not the kind of person who jumps to conclusions, but I wasn't taking any chances. Every door was locked. Every window was shut tight. No signs of forced entry, nothing out of place. The house was empty and the only person who had been inside was me. So where the hell had that photo come from? I went back to the spare room, the scene of last night's chaos, and that's when I noticed something even stranger. The printer's power cord, which I had unplugged after the first incident, was still neatly wrapped up on the desk. I hadn't touched it since I threw the printer out the window, and yet here it was, coiled up like it had never been used. I felt a rising sense of panic. There was no logical way for that printer to have worked without being plugged in. I hadn't connected it to any computer, it wasn't on Wi-Fi, and yet it had printed photos of me. Photos that shouldn't exist. I even checked my phone and laptop to make sure there wasn't some random Bluetooth or wireless connection I had missed. But no, they were all disconnected. The printer was completely isolated from everything, or at least it should have been. I spent the next few hours sitting at my kitchen table, staring at that photo of myself. I tried calling a few friends, not to tell them what happened because they'd think I was insane, but just to hear a normal voice, to ground myself in reality. It helped a little. But the moment I hung up, the uneasiness came rushing back. I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't the only one who had been in my house. I tried convincing myself that there had to be some kind of glitch or a leftover memory from the printer's previous owner. Maybe it was some elaborate prank, but who would go through that much effort just to mess with me? And why? I even considered calling the police, but what would I say? Hey, I bought a haunted printer off the dark web, and now it's printing creepy photos of me. Oh, and by the way, it wasn't plugged in. Yeah, I'd get laughed right off the phone. I knew what I had to do. The printer had to go. Not just out the window this time, but gone. Like, I need to get this thing out of my house gone. I wasn't going to sell it or donate it, because I didn't want this curse hanging over anyone else. I was going to get rid of it in the most final way I could think of. The trash. But just as I was about to grab it and haul it to the curb, something stopped me. A thought crept into my mind. One that I had been avoiding since the first moment those pictures started printing. What if there was something else the printer was trying to show me? Something I hadn't seen yet? I didn't want to admit it, but a part of me was morbidly curious. If I destroyed the printer without knowing, what then? What if there was something more to the photos? Something hidden? Maybe it had printed others and I hadn't noticed them yet. That's when I made the decision that would change everything. I was going to let the printer print again. The thought of letting that printer run again terrified me, but at the same time there was this nagging voice in the back of my head, daring me to see what else it had to show. I don't know what possessed me to even consider it, but the more I thought about it, the more I felt like I had to know. I couldn't just throw it away without figuring out what was really going on. So, against my better judgment, I dragged the printer back inside. I wiped off the dirt and leaves from its brief stay in the yard, and I set it back on the desk in the spare room, right where it had been before. It still smelled weird, like that mix of burnt plastic and damp paper, but I ignored it. This time, though, I wasn't going to just let it start printing in the middle of the night. I was going to take control. I plugged it in, and immediately the familiar whirring sound filled the room. I sat down at my desk, staring at the printer like it was some kind of bomb I was waiting to go off. It hummed for a few seconds, but nothing happened. No lights blinked. No papers started feeding through. For a second, I actually felt relieved. Maybe it had finally died. 
Maybe whatever glitch had been plaguing it had burned out for good. But just as I was about to unplug it and give up, the tray shifted and the printer made that clicking noise again. The same noise it made before the pages started spitting out the night before. Then it started printing. The first page that slid out was another picture of one of those porcelain dolls. But this time, something was different. Instead of the blank, empty background from the previous photos, this one had a setting. It was a bedroom, dimly lit with old wooden furniture that looked familiar. I grabbed the page and stared at it. That bed frame. I knew that bed frame. It was the same one from my grandma's house, the one she had in her guest room when I was little. I remember sleeping there during the summer when I'd visit her. The creaky wooden floors and that distinct smell of old books and lavender perfume. The next page printed almost immediately after the first. It was another doll, but this time it wasn't just sitting in the room. It was posed in the bed, lying down like a person with the covers pulled up to its chest. The sheets were wrinkled like someone had actually climbed into the bed and tucked themselves in. I felt my stomach twist, but I couldn't stop looking. The third page came out and this time the doll wasn't alone. In the corner of the room, just barely visible in the shadows, there was a figure, small, almost childlike, but with a distorted face. At first I thought it was just the photo quality, grainy and low res like all the other prints, but the longer I stared the more I realized the face was intentionally blurred, like it was trying to hide something. I flipped the page over, hoping that maybe the back would give me some clue, but it was blank. Before I could even process what I was seeing, the fourth page came out, and this one nearly made me drop the whole stack. It was my grandma's room again, but this time, the doll in the bed wasn't just lying there. It was sitting up staring directly at the camera, and behind it, that same blurred figure was now standing at the foot of the bed, facing the camera too, like they were posing for the shot. I felt my heart pounding in my chest, but I kept flipping through the pages. I had to see it through. The fifth page slid out, and I braced myself. But this one wasn't a doll. It wasn't anything I expected. It was me again. But this time, it wasn't a picture of me sitting at my desk like before. This one was of me sleeping. The angle was from the foot of my bed, looking directly at me as I lay there, completely unaware. My eyes were closed, and I was wearing the same shirt I had fallen asleep in the night before. The light coming from the window was exactly how it had been that morning when I woke up. I felt a wave of nausea. The implication was impossible to ignore. Someone, or something, had been in my room while I was sleeping. But the scariest part? The figure from the previous photo, the blurred one that had been standing in my grandma's room, was now in the corner of my room. It wasn't just an old, blurry image of a distant past. It was here, now, in my house. I dropped the stack of photos onto the desk and stood up, backing away from the printer. My mind was racing, trying to make sense of it all, but nothing added up. There was no way this printer was some old haunted object. It had to be more than that. Someone was doing this. But who? And how? I checked the power cord again, just to make sure I wasn't imagining things. It was plugged in now, but before, last night, it had printed without being connected to anything. There was no reasonable explanation for what was happening, and the more I thought about it, the more I felt trapped in some kind of nightmare. I didn't know what to do next, call the police, but what would I tell them? that I had a possessed printer that was spitting out photos of my dead grandma's house and dolls. They'd think I was crazy. I sat back down at my desk, staring at the printer like it held all the answers. But what I really wanted was to get rid of it. This thing had to go, but I couldn't just toss it out again. I needed to destroy it. I grabbed the pile of photos and stuffed them in a drawer. I didn't want to look at them anymore, but I also couldn't bring myself to throw them away just yet. They felt like evidence, something I might need later. Then I turned to the printer. My hands were shaking as I unplugged it, this time for good. 
I grabbed a screwdriver from my kitchen drawer and went back to the room. If I was going to get rid of it, I wanted to see what was inside first. Maybe there was some kind of hidden camera or a storage device that someone had used to plant those photos. As I pried open the back panel, though, I realized something that made my stomach churn. The printer was old, way older than I thought. There were no modern parts, no signs of tampering, no hidden compartments. It was just a rusted mess of old wires and gears, like it hadn't been touched in decades. And yet, it had printed photos of me sleeping. I put the screwdriver down and stepped back. My mind was running in circles, but nothing made sense. It was like the more I tried to explain it, the less logical everything became. That's when I heard it, the familiar whirring sound coming from behind me. I turned around and my heart dropped. The printer had powered on by itself again. The sound of the printer powering on by itself was like a punch to the gut. I stood there frozen in place, watching as the machine, which I had just unplugged, started humming like nothing was wrong. This was beyond any glitch or malfunction. The logical side of my brain was screaming at me to leave, to throw the thing out once and for all, but I couldn't move. Something had a hold on me, an eerie magnetic pull to stay and see what it would print this time. Against my better judgment, I sat back down at the desk, watching as the paper tray rattled and another sheet of paper slowly slid out. The first print that emerged wasn't what I expected. It wasn't a photo of a doll, or my grandma's room, or even another unsettling shot of me. It was a note, plain black text, printed in a simple, old-school typeface. Are you ready to see the truth? I blinked. What truth? What was this printer trying to tell me? My heart was pounding so hard I could hear it in my ears, but I couldn't tear my eyes away from the paper. I kept trying to rationalize what was happening. Maybe there was some kind of hidden program embedded in the printer's software, something left by a previous owner. But then again, how could that explain the picture of me sleeping? That wasn't some leftover file. Before I had time to process the note, the printer word again, and another sheet started to slide out. This one was a picture. At first, I didn't recognize it. It was a photo of a street, dark and empty, taken at night. The street lights cast long, eerie shadows over the pavement, and in the distance, there was a figure standing at the far end of the road. The image was grainy, like it had been taken with a cheap disposable camera, but the figure, something about it sent a chill through me. It was that same blurry shape from the earlier photos, the one that had been standing in my grandma's room. It looked closer this time, more defined, but still out of focus, like it wasn't meant to be seen clearly. I held the photo up, staring at it, trying to figure out why it felt so familiar. Then it hit me. That was my street, the one I lived on. I recognized the houses, the cracked sidewalk, the old oak tree at the corner. The figure in the distance was standing right where my house would be. I felt the air leave my lungs. The printer didn't stop, though. Another page slid out, and this one was even worse. It was the same street, the same angle, but the figure was closer now, much closer, standing right in front of my house. I dropped the photo on the desk and took a step back. My mind was racing. My legs felt like they were glued to the floor, but I forced myself to move. I rushed to the front window and pulled back the curtain, half expecting to see someone standing outside, but the street was empty. No one was there, just the quiet stillness of early morning, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone. I backed away from the window, my hands shaking, as the printer continued to spit out more pictures. I didn't want to look, but I had to. I grabbed the next one off the tray and my stomach twisted in knots. It was a photo of my front door, the same angle as if someone was standing just outside looking in. The blurry figure was right up against the door now, but its face. I couldn't make out any features. It was just a smudge, a dark blur where its face should have been, like someone had wiped over the image before it developed. The body, though, was more visible than ever. 
tall, thin, almost human, but off. I didn't know how to explain it, but something about the proportions seemed wrong. Too long, too stretched. Another photo came out. My front hallway. The one I was standing in now. My vision blurred with panic as I looked around, trying to see if something, someone was there. But again, nothing. I was alone. At least I thought I was. But the printer wasn't done. The next photo was me, standing right where I was, holding the last photo in my hand. It had just been taken. The angle was low, as if the camera had been placed on the floor, capturing me from below. The detail was eerie, almost hyper-real. I could see the exact expression of confusion and fear on my face as I stared at the photo, mirroring the one in the picture. I backed away from the desk, trying to figure out where this camera could be hidden. Was someone watching me right now? I scanned the room, my eyes darting to every corner, but there was nothing. No sign of a camera, no movement, no sound other than the soft hum of the printer. My hands shook as the printer produced another sheet. This time I almost didn't want to look, but I had to know. I forced myself to grab the page. It was a photo of my bedroom, the same angle as the previous one of me sleeping, except this time I wasn't in bed. The sheets were pulled back, the bed empty, but the blurred figure was now sitting at the foot of the mattress, as if waiting for me to return. I dropped the photo. This wasn't just some glitchy, haunted device. Something was in my house, watching me, moving room to room. The photos weren't showing the past, they were showing the present. I ran out of the spare room and grabbed my phone, my hands trembling so badly I could barely hold on to it. I didn't care how crazy I sounded anymore. I was going to call the police, tell them there was someone in my house that I needed help. But as I punched in the numbers, the printer gave one last loud whir. One final sheet slid out and this one froze me in my tracks. It was a picture of the front of my house again. But this time the photo was zoomed in on the living room window. The same window I had been standing at minutes ago, looking out into the street. And behind the glass, barely visible but unmistakable, was me. The angle was impossible, like the shot had been taken from right behind me from inside the house. I couldn't breathe. There was no way. I'd been alone. The street was empty. But then I realized. The photo wasn't of me looking out the window. It was of me standing in front of it, looking back. As I stood there, paralyzed with fear, I heard the softest creak come from upstairs, just above my head. Someone or something was inside. The creak from upstairs echoed through the house like a slow, deliberate warning. My mind was racing, trying to make sense of everything. But there was no sense to be made. The photos, the figure, the impossible angles, it all pointed to one horrifying conclusion. I wasn't alone. I stood in the hallway, frozen, my phone clutched in my hand, still trembling. I had every intention of calling the police, but something stopped me. That noise from upstairs. It wasn't just a random sound. It was movement, like someone shifting their weight on the old wooden floors. Slowly. Carefully. I couldn't just stand there. I had to know what was happening. I took a deep breath, as quietly as I could manage and started moving toward the staircase. Each step felt like it took a lifetime, the hallway stretching out before me like some twisted nightmare. My eyes were locked on the top of the stairs, half expecting to see the blurred figure from the photos waiting for me, but nothing appeared. The house was deathly silent except for the faint hum of the printer in the other room, still running, still alive in its own eerie way. I reached the bottom of the stairs and hesitated, Every instinct screamed at me to turn around, to leave, but something inside told me I had to finish this. Whatever this was, it was connected to that printer, and to my house, and if I didn't face it now, it would never stop. I started up the stairs, gripping the banister so tightly my knuckles turned white. Each step creaked under my weight, 
but it was the soft, distant noise coming from the hallway above that unnerved me the most. It was like someone, or something, was pacing just out of sight, moving deliberately. When I reached the top, I stopped. The hallway stretched out in front of me, the door to my bedroom ajar. A sliver of light spilled out into the hallway from the window inside, but the rest of the house was in shadow. That's when I heard it again, the faintest sound of paper shifting like someone picking up a stack of photographs and slowly flipping through them. I stepped toward the door, my heart pounding in my chest. As I reached out to push the door open, I half expected to see that blurred figure sitting on my bed waiting. But when I pushed the door the rest of the way open, the room was empty. Or so I thought. There, sitting neatly on the foot of my bed, was another stack of photos. I hadn't put them there. I hadn't touched anything in this room since the last printed photo of the figure at my window. My mind was screaming that this was wrong, all of it was wrong, but I stepped into the room anyway. I bent down and picked up the top photo. It was a picture of me taken just seconds ago standing at the foot of my bed holding the stack of photos. I dropped it, my hands shaking uncontrollably now. The next photo was of me dropping the first photo, the one I had just seen. It was like the printer knew exactly what I was doing, as if it was predicting my every move. I flipped to the next photo. It showed me turning around, looking toward the hallway, right where I was standing now as if I was about to leave the room. But there in the corner, in the shadows just behind me, was the figure. I could barely make out its outline, but it was there, close enough to touch. I spun around, my heart racing, but the room was empty or at least it looked empty. The air felt thick, almost suffocating. I couldn't see anything, but I felt it. Something was there, lurking just out of reach, just beyond what my eyes could process. I couldn't stay in that room any longer. I bolted for the door, but as I did, I heard it, another creak, this time right behind me. I didn't dare turn around. I ran down the stairs, my feet barely touching the steps and burst into the spare room where the printer was still humming softly. I grabbed it, yanking the plug from the wall with more force than necessary. The whirring stopped instantly, the silence in the room almost deafening. I wasn't going to take any chances. This thing had caused enough horror, and I wasn't going to wait for the next print to slide out. I carried the printer to the backyard again, only this time I wasn't just tossing it out the window. I marched it straight to the back gate where the trash bin sat and threw the entire thing inside. I slammed the lid down and backed away like it was about to spring back to life. But it didn't. The air outside was cold and the street was still. No figures in the distance. No blurred shapes lurking at the corners of my vision. Just silence. I stood there for a few minutes, waiting. For what? I don't know. Maybe for the printer to power itself back on somehow. For the impossible to start up again. But it never did. I went back inside, locking every door and window behind me. I felt safer, but not by much. I knew that just because I had thrown it away didn't mean it was over. When I got back to the spare room, I sat down at my desk, staring at the empty space where the printer had been. The drawer where I had stuffed the earlier photos was still half open. Part of me didn't want to look at them again, but I needed to know. I needed to make sure I hadn't imagined everything. I pulled the stack of photos out and flipped through them again. The dolls, the street, the picture of me standing at the window. It was all still there, just as real as it had been hours ago. I let out a shaky breath, relieved that for now there was no new photo, no new print. But as I was putting the photos back, something caught my eye. There, tucked between two of the pictures I had already seen, was a new one. It hadn't been there before. My heart sank as I pulled it out. It was a picture of me, sitting at my desk in the exact same spot I was sitting now. And there, just over my shoulder, was the blurred figure again, standing in the doorway, watching me. I dropped the photo my breath catching in my throat. The printer was gone. The photos had stopped. But the thing in the picture? 
it was still here. I know it sounds ridiculous, but I wasn't even planning on going that deep into the internet. I just got curious after watching too many late night YouTube videos about the dark web. You know the ones? They talk about creepy marketplaces and bizarre services you can hire, stuff like that. I never really believed any of it. It all felt like some urban legend, just internet folklore people used to scare each other. But of course, I'm an idiot with too much time on my hands. And I figured, how hard can it be to just take a peek? Setting up tour was easy. Honestly, that was the first red flag. You expect something illegal or dangerous to be difficult to access, right? But no. Five minutes of browsing forums and I had the browser installed and running. That's probably where I should have stopped. But like I said, curiosity got the better of me. At first, it was just what I expected. Boring pages filled with drug dealers, weird services, and overpriced, shady-looking products. But then I stumbled across this strange link buried in a forum, and something about it grabbed my attention. The page was stark, just a black background with a single line of text that read, See what you're not supposed to see. Underneath that, there was a button to enter. I know, I know. This is where anyone with half a brain would have clicked away, but I wasn't thinking clearly. It felt like one of those mysterious rabbit holes people talk about, and I guess I just wanted to know how deep it went. So, I clicked. The site that loaded up was weird. It wasn't a marketplace or a service like the others. Instead, it looked like a simple sign-up page, asking for basic details, username, password, and an email address. For a second, I hesitated. There's a huge part of me that understands how dumb I was about what I did next. But in that moment, I wasn't thinking clearly. Maybe it was because everything else on the dark web seemed so fake or harmless by then. So, without much thought, I entered my information. Yeah, I entered my real email address. It wasn't until after I hit submit that I realized the enormity of what I'd just done. I'm not a tech genius, but I've watched enough videos to know that using any personal information on the dark web is like practically begging for something bad to happen. The page refreshed, but instead of showing any kind of confirmation or welcome screen, it just blinked and gave me a 404 error. Broken link, I thought. Great. That should have been the end of it. I closed the Tor browser, figuring that was that, and went on with my night. I tried to shake off the nagging feeling that I'd made a huge mistake, but there wasn't much I could do at that point. I just told myself it was fine, that nothing would come of it, and spent the rest of the night gaming on my PC to distract myself. The next morning, though, things got weird. I woke up and reached for my phone like I do every day. You know that routine? Checking texts, social media, and emails before you even get out of bed. But as soon as I unlocked my phone, I noticed this unfamiliar app icon sitting on my home screen. It was bright red, with no name. Just a weird symbol. Something like a triangle with an eye in the middle. At first, I thought maybe I downloaded some app by accident, or maybe it was some kind of update. But there was no name underneath it, no description. I tapped on it and nothing happened. It didn't open, didn't show any kind of loading screen, just nothing. Weird, right? I tried to delete it, but the option to remove or uninstall wasn't there. It was like the app was part of my phone now, like it had been built in from the start. By this point, I'm freaking out. I checked my recent downloads, checked the app store, my phone settings. Nothing gave me any clue where this thing came from. It was just... there. Here's the thing, though. The moment I noticed the app, my phone started acting strange. Notifications weren't coming through and calls were dropping before I could answer them. And when I tried to access the internet, everything would load fine except my email. Every time I opened Gmail, it would freeze, crash, or give me some error code I'd never seen before. I don't know why, but I immediately connected this back to the dark web. That dumb website I'd signed up for with my real email. I mean, what else could it have been? It was the only weird thing I'd done recently. By lunchtime, I was paranoid. I even reset my phone, thinking maybe it was just some sort of glitch or bug. After the reset, though, the app was still there, staring back at me from the screen as if it hadn't gone anywhere. 
That night, I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd done something irreversible, something I couldn't undo. But the real nightmare didn't start until the next day. All right, so after that weird app appeared on my phone and refused to go away, I figured maybe I could just ignore it. I mean, as long as my phone worked for everything else, it couldn't be that bad, right? At least that's what I told myself. But by the next morning, ignoring it wasn't an option. I woke up early, already uneasy from the previous day. The whole phone thing had me on edge, and the thought of that stupid app lurking there just didn't sit right with me. Still, I tried to brush it off. People probably get weird glitches on their phones all the time, right? But that morning, as soon as I unlocked my phone, I noticed something else. A notification. Now, I know what you're thinking. What's the big deal about a notification? But this one wasn't like any I'd seen before. It wasn't from any app I recognized. Not even the mystery app. There was no source listed. Just a plain gray box at the top of my screen that said, We know what you've seen. I stared at it for a minute, trying to make sense of it. It didn't make any sense. Was it some sort of spam? A virus? Maybe a phishing scam? But no, this wasn't an email or a random text. This was showing up as a system notification. It even made that same little ding sound as if it were from a normal app. Against my better judgment, I clicked on it. The screen went black for a second, and I thought maybe my phone had crashed again. But then, after a moment, my browser opened, on its own, and took me to some kind of chat room. It wasn't a normal website. It looked like something straight out of the 90s, like one of those old message boards from back in the day. The design was basic, white text on a black background, no images, no ads, nothing. There were only two messages in the chat, both from the same user. The username was just a string of random letters and numbers. Here's the thing that got me, though. The first message read, You signed up. Now we know. The second one, right below it, said, Don't try to run. At that point, my heart was racing. I knew this had to be connected to that dark website I stupidly signed up for. But how was it on my phone now? Was someone controlling it remotely? Had I downloaded some kind of malware that was watching me? A hundred paranoid thoughts started racing through my head, but none of them made me feel any better. I closed the browser immediately and went back to my home screen, hoping the whole thing would just disappear if I ignored it long enough, but that's when I noticed the app again. It had changed. The red triangle with the eye was still there, but now there was a small notification badge in the corner, like an unread message. I didn't want to open it. Every fiber of my being was screaming at me to leave it alone, to throw my phone in the nearest lake and be done with it. But you know that feeling when something's right in front of you and you just have to look, even though you know it's a bad idea. Yeah, that's exactly what this was. So, like an idiot, I tapped the app. This time it opened. The screen went dark. And for a moment, I thought maybe my phone had frozen again. But then a single line of text appeared in the center of the screen. It wasn't a message, not exactly. It was more like a command. Tell no one. I stared at those words for what felt like forever. I mean, who was even behind this? What did they want from me? I had no idea what I'd gotten myself into, and the more I thought about it, the worse it felt. I tried to shake it off, telling myself this was just some sort of prank or scam. Maybe they were trying to freak me out to get me to pay for some fake security service or something like that. But then the messages started getting... personal. That same day, I got another notification. Same weird gray box at the top of my screen. Only this time it didn't say anything cryptic. It just said my name. First and last. I froze. How did they know my name? I hadn't entered it anywhere, at least not on that site, I was sure of that. But then it hit me. My email. I had signed up with my real email, the one that's connected to everything. They could have pulled my info from that. I was furious with myself for being so careless. But then came the second message. This one wasn't a notification. 
It was a text. Not from any number I recognized, but it came through as a normal SMS, as if someone had my phone number. It simply said, we're closer than you think. That's when I started to panic. I immediately went to my email and tried to change my passwords, everything from my bank to social media accounts. But the weird thing was, my Gmail still wouldn't load. It was like the app had corrupted that part of my phone. I even tried to log in from my computer, but no luck. I couldn't access my inbox at all. Things got worse after that. Throughout the rest of the day, I kept getting these strange notifications, each one more unsettling than the last. They started off vague, random phrases like, you shouldn't have looked, or we see you. But then they started getting specific. One notification mentioned my exact location, my street name. Another one listed my recent Google searches. It was like whoever was behind this had full access to my phone, my life. And no matter what I did, I couldn't get rid of that app. I told myself I'd factory reset the phone, or maybe even get a new one if it came to that. But before I could do anything, I got one last message that made my stomach drop. It was another text, and it simply said, See you soon. I dropped my phone and didn't touch it for the rest of the night. But even as I tried to sleep, the thought nagged at me. What had I signed up for? And how were they already this deep into my life? The next day, though, things escalated even further. What happened after that made me wish I'd never gone anywhere near that dark web link. I barely slept that night. Every little sound made me jump. I kept checking the time, convinced that at any moment something bad was about to happen. I don't know what I expected. Maybe someone breaking in or finding some stranger standing outside my house. But nothing happened. By the time the sun came up, I'd convinced myself that it was all just an elaborate scare tactic. Maybe some hacker group was messing with me for fun. But there wasn't anything real to worry about. Right? Wrong. That morning, as I went about my usual routine, I decided I couldn't let this go on. I needed to get help. But first, I had to get rid of that app. The night before, I'd been too freaked out to even touch my phone, but now I was determined to fix it. I grabbed the phone and opened my settings, scrolling down to find some way to delete the app, or at the very least reset everything. That's when I realized something was really wrong. All my settings were locked, not just the app settings, but everything. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, storage, security. It was like my phone was no longer mine. Even more disturbing, every time I tried to access any of these features, the same red triangle icon would flash for a split second, almost like the app was watching everything I did. I couldn't uninstall it, couldn't reset my phone, couldn't do anything. I tried to keep calm. Maybe if I took it to a tech store, they could wipe the phone for me. I was about to head out the door when my phone buzzed again. Another text. This one was different. It was an image. I swiped to open it, and my stomach dropped. It was a photo of my house, taken from the street right outside my front door. The timestamp showed it had been taken just a few minutes earlier. My heart started pounding. I ran to the window and pulled the curtain aside, half expecting to see someone standing there watching me. But the street was empty. No cars, no people, nothing. I stood there for a few minutes just staring, trying to piece together how they'd gotten that photo. Had someone been outside my house that morning while I was still in bed? Was it taken during the night while I was trying to sleep? My phone buzzed again. Another image. This time it was a close-up of my front door. Like whoever was taking these pictures was right there, standing on my porch. I don't know what I was thinking, but instinct took over, and I rushed to the door. I threw it open, hoping to catch whoever it was, but when I looked out, there was no one. Just the quiet, empty street. I stepped outside, still clutching my phone, scanning the area for any sign of movement. There wasn't a sound, not even a car passing by. 
That eerie silence made everything worse. I knew someone had been there, but it was like they'd vanished as soon as I opened the door. And then it hit me. What if they hadn't left? What if they were still nearby watching me from somewhere? My hands were shaking as I locked the door behind me and hurried back inside. I tried to call someone, anyone, for help, but my phone wouldn't let me make a call. Every time I tried, the screen would go black for a few seconds before kicking me back to the home screen. No matter what I did, the app wouldn't let me contact anyone. It was as if the phone was being controlled remotely, like someone else had taken over my life without me even realizing it. And then came the knock. It wasn't loud or frantic. Just three slow, deliberate knocks on the front door. My breath caught in my throat. I didn't move. For a second, I thought maybe I'd imagined it. But then the knocks came again. Three more, exactly the same. Slow and steady. I don't know what possessed me, but I walked to the door. My feet felt heavy, like they were moving on their own. I stood there staring at the door for what felt like forever, my hand hovering over the doorknob. I wanted to look through the peephole, but something in me wouldn't let me. It was like I already knew what I'd see, or worse, I didn't want to know. Instead, I stood frozen, waiting for something to happen. The knocking stopped. I waited another minute, then two. Still nothing. I took a deep breath and finally built up the courage to check the peephole. Slowly, I leaned forward and peered through. There was no one there. I opened the door a crack, just enough to peek outside, and once again the street was empty. But then I noticed something. On the ground, right in front of my door, was a small black envelope. I hadn't seen it before, but now it was unmistakable standing out against the pale concrete of my porch. My first thought was not to touch it. I mean, after everything that had happened, I knew this was connected. But my curiosity got the better of me. I grabbed the envelope and rushed back inside, locking the door behind me. It felt heavier than I expected. I sat down on the couch and carefully opened it, sliding out a single piece of thick folded paper. There were no markings on the outside, nothing to suggest who it was from. But inside, scrawled in messy, uneven handwriting, were three words that chilled me to the core. Stop ignoring us. That was it. I threw the envelope and paper across the room, like somehow that would make it all go away. But deep down, I knew that whatever I had gotten myself into wasn't going to end that easily. It was like these people, or whoever they were, knew everything about me, and they weren't going to stop until they got what they wanted. The worst part? I still had no idea what that was. I spent the rest of the day with my phone turned off, but the dread wouldn't go away. Every knock, every creak in the house sent my heart racing. I couldn't shake the feeling that someone, or something, was out there, just waiting for me to slip up again. And sure enough, by nightfall, things escalated even further. What happened next made me realize just how deep I'd gotten myself into this nightmare. By the time the sun started to set, my nerves were completely shot. I had spent the entire day pacing around my house, jumping at every little sound. I didn't dare turn my phone back on. I figured if I kept it off, maybe this would all stop. Or at least I wouldn't have to deal with the constant barrage of creepy messages and notifications. But deep down, I knew it wasn't going to be that simple. I couldn't ignore that black envelope. The threatening words, stop ignoring us. Whoever they were, they clearly weren't going away just because I wanted them to. I kept replaying the events of the past few days in my head, trying to figure out where I went wrong, how I could fix it. I had never felt more out of control in my life. It was like these faceless people, or whatever they were, had complete control over everything. That evening, I decided to take a different approach. Since I couldn't use my phone, I went to my computer. My plan was simple. Research everything I could about the dark web, apps that can't be deleted, 
anything that might help me figure out what was happening. Maybe there were others like me, people who had stumbled into something they weren't supposed to see. I was desperate for answers, but the moment I turned on my PC, I realized something was wrong. The screen flickered for a second before loading up the desktop, which wasn't unusual for my old computer. But as soon as I tried to open my browser, it crashed. I tried again. Same thing. After a few more attempts, I finally got the browser to stay open, but as soon as I typed dark web apps into the search bar, the browser froze. Then it closed itself. I stared at the screen, confused, until a small pop-up appeared in the corner. We told you not to look. It wasn't an ordinary notification. It wasn't from my antivirus or any software I'd installed. It was them. The same people who had hijacked my phone had somehow infiltrated my computer, too. My stomach dropped. I hadn't even thought about that until now. Of course, they could be in my computer. I had accessed the dark web on this very PC. I shut the laptop down immediately, as if that would somehow make everything stop. But the paranoia had already settled in. If they had my phone and my computer, what else could they control? My Wi-Fi? My smart TV? I felt like my entire life had been compromised. I was being watched, listened to, maybe even tracked, and I didn't know how to stop it. With nothing else to do, I sat in the dark, trying to calm myself down. I hadn't eaten all day, but I couldn't bring myself to make food. Every time I thought about going into the kitchen, I'd imagine someone outside, watching me through the window. I kept the curtains closed, but that didn't help. I felt like there were eyes on me from every direction, waiting for me to make the wrong move. I couldn't take it anymore. I decided to leave the house. I figured if I could just get out of here, go somewhere public with people around, I might feel safe, even if just for a little while. So I grabbed my jacket and keys, ready to head out the door. But as soon as I reached for the doorknob, my phone, which had been off all day, buzzed from across the room. I froze. I hadn't turned it on. I walked over to where I had left it, sitting face down on the coffee table. The screen was lit up, but the phone was still off. It was stuck on that dead black screen you get right before a phone powers down completely. And yet, there was a notification. A text message. Against every ounce of common sense I had left, I picked up the phone and unlocked it. The screen blinked to life, and there it was. Another message from that same unknown number. You won't find them. Them? Who was them? I stood there, staring at the words, trying to make sense of it. My brain was working overtime, trying to piece together what was happening. And then I heard it. A faint tapping sound, like knuckles softly rapping against glass. I whipped my head toward the window, but the curtains were still drawn. My heart was pounding in my chest. The tapping came again, this time a little louder, more insistent. I didn't want to look. I knew better, but something pulled me toward the window anyway. I took a deep breath and slowly, carefully pulled back the curtain. There was no one there, just the empty street, bathed in the glow of the streetlights. No figures, no cars parked in front of the house, nothing. But the tapping sound, it hadn't been in my head. It was real. I was sure of it. I was about to let the curtain fall back into place when I noticed something on the ground, just outside my window. At first, I thought it was a shadow or a trick of the light, but as my eyes adjusted I realized it was another envelope, identical to the one I had found earlier. I stood frozen for a second, debating whether to go outside and grab it. But I couldn't leave it there, I had to know what was inside. I threw on my jacket, unlocked the door and ran out to the window. The envelope was smaller this time and lighter. I ripped it open right there on the porch, not caring if anyone was watching. Inside there was a single folded piece of paper just like the last one, but this time the message wasn't written in messy handwriting, it was typed. Neat, precise, like someone had taken their time with it. We told you to stop looking. I don't know why, 
but the neatness of it terrified me more than anything else that had happened. This wasn't a prank. This wasn't someone messing with me. This was calculated. Whoever was behind this had been planning it for a while, and they were serious. I went back inside, locked the door, and sat down on the couch, holding the note in my hand. My mind was racing with questions. Why me? What had I done? How had this escalated so quickly from a stupid decision on the dark web to this? But the biggest question, the one I couldn't shake, was this. What were they going to do next? And then just as I was about to lose myself in panic, my phone buzzed again. This time the message was even shorter. You have one more chance. I stared at the screen trying to figure out what they meant. What chance? What was I supposed to do? I didn't have long to think about it though because almost immediately after, there was another knock on the door. This one was different, louder, more forceful. And this time I knew for sure that whoever was behind it wasn't going to just leave quietly. I stood there, staring at the door, my heart thudding so loud I could almost hear it echoing in the empty house. The knock was different this time, deliberate, forceful. Whoever was out there wasn't going to wait for me to come willingly. It was clear that this was my final chance to act, to do something, but what? What did they want me to do? The last text still glowed on my phone screen. You have one more chance. My mind was spinning. One more chance for what? To stop? To run? I couldn't shake the feeling that no matter what I chose, I was already in too deep. But sitting there frozen wasn't going to help either. The knock came again, harder this time. Three sharp thuds. I needed to make a decision. Taking a deep breath, I walked to the door, but this time, I didn't just open it right away. Something in me hesitated. Instead, I leaned forward and pressed my ear to the wood, straining to hear if there was any sound on the other side, breathing, footsteps, anything, but there was nothing, just silence. With a shaking hand, I slowly unlocked the deadbolt and cracked the door open, just enough to peer through. My porch was empty again just like before no one was there. But this time I noticed something new. Sitting on the welcome mat was a small black device, a phone, the older kind with buttons instead of a touch screen. The screen was dark, but it was unmistakably left there for me. I knelt down and picked it up, half expecting something to happen the moment I touched it, but it stayed silent, as if waiting for me to make the first move. I took it inside, locking the door behind me, and sat down at the kitchen table with it in my hands. I don't know why I didn't throw it out or smash it. Maybe because I knew this was the only way I was going to get any answers. My phone buzzed again. Another message. Pick it up. The timing was too perfect to ignore. They wanted me to use this old phone. I stared at it for a while, debating what to do. But after everything I had been through, I couldn't back out now. So I took a deep breath and powered it on. It lit up immediately. No boot screen or logo. Just a bright white background and a single message, much like the ones I'd been receiving all along. This time, though, it wasn't a threat. It wasn't a warning. It was an instruction. Turn off all devices. Now. For a second, I didn't move. What did they mean, turn off all devices? My phone? My computer? My router? But something told me they weren't kidding. Whoever was behind this clearly had control over my tech already. They were probably watching everything through my phone's camera, listening to every word I said. Without thinking too much, I grabbed my phone and powered it off completely. I didn't stop there. I went around the house, unplugging everything, my laptop, my smart TV, even the Wi-Fi router. Every device that could possibly connect to the internet went dark. When I finished, I sat down with the old phone in front of me, waiting for something to happen. I half expected the lights to go out, for some sort of blackout to follow, but nothing did. Everything stayed eerily normal. Then the old phone buzzed again. Another message popped up. You listened. Now listen carefully. I held my breath as the next message came through and this one chilled me to the bone. We've erased the data. 
It's over. Do not speak of this. I blinked at the screen, reading the words over and over again. It was over? Just like that? I didn't believe it. How could it be over? What did they mean by erase the data? Were they talking about my email, the app, everything they had planted? I had no way of knowing if they were telling the truth. But before I could even think of how to respond, another message came through. Do not return. You will not get another warning. The screen went dark and no matter what I did, I couldn't get the phone to turn back on again. It was like it had never worked in the first place, just a black brick in my hands. I sat there for a long time, staring at it, trying to process what had just happened. It felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders, but I couldn't shake the lingering sense of unease. Could it really be over? Or were they just waiting for me to slip up again? Over the next few days, I tried to get back to normal. I powered on my devices, reconnected everything, and cautiously checked my accounts. Everything seemed fine. My email worked again. The strange app was gone from my phone, like it had never existed. There were no more mysterious texts or creepy notifications. It was like the nightmare had never happened. But I couldn't forget the messages. Do not return. The dark web wasn't just some anonymous playground for curious people like me. It was full of places I should have never stumbled into. The people behind that app, behind those messages, weren't playing around. They had the power to reach into my life in ways I couldn't even begin to comprehend. And I had been stupid enough to hand them my information on a silver platter. I've thought about that day a lot since then. What would have happened if I hadn't listened? If I had kept digging? Would they have come for me or done something worse? I'll never know. And frankly, I don't want to know. If there's one thing I've learned from all of this, it's to never take the internet at face value. Curiosity might be tempting, but there are places you're not meant to see. And when those places start reaching back into your life, the consequences can be terrifying. So, yeah. I won't be going near the dark web again. Ever. And if you're smart, you won't either.